short today we discuss about core web vitals and we can touch topics about site migration because it's important today in SEO field to know how to set up the right uh, settings, <laughs> especially touching these topics. And I'm excited to discuss this topic with Katie Ellis Brown. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, for me, it's a big pleasure. I want to learn more. I know that SEO is a complex mechanism. That's why I'm learning from many prominent experts. So right now I'm excited to know more about that. Before we start, just tell more about your experience background and why you decided to share with us about this important topics. Oh, yes. Uh, boy, I've been doing SEO for over 12 years now. <laughs> So, oh, nice. um, I, yeah, I, I mostly focus on technical SEO topics, but, oh boy, I've done everything, you know, from content strategy to um, even a little bit of outreach, out, outreach for backlinks. But yes, definitely my core expertise is in the technical arena. And so for the last six to nine months, I've been actually focusing on Core Web Vitals, but I also also do migrations. I've done quite a few of those during my whole time as an SEO. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love it, you know, because uh, I see when uh, SEO specialists uh, pay attention to one direction, they can provide much better results than someone who is trying, you know, to cover everything, you know, because SEO is huge, you know, I know some specialists who can provide only one new building technique to earn a million dollars, you know, just to pay attention to one specific technique. That's why uh, if you pay attention to technical optimization, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm excited to know this knowledge. Can you tell uh, about core web vitals? What does it mean and why we uh, masters need to pay attention to that? Yeah, so Google kind of made us care about core web vitals. Um, because they rolled out um, a page experience ranking factor. And the page experience ranking factor, which I call it an aggregate ranking factor because it has multiple ranking factors in it. It had some of the old ones we knew about, like HTTPS, mobile friendliness, and the absence of intrusive interstitials. Um, but what is also part of the page experience ranking factor is Core Web Vitals. And this, they gave us a year's notice on Core Web Vitals. They're going, hey, you know, this is coming. And then it rolled out for mobile in the summer of 2021 for us in the Northern Hemisphere. And then it also rolled out for desktop in February of 2022, which was this year. And Core Vitals are basically a measure of the page experience. So we might remember that, you know, in the past, uh, Google did say, you know, you you need to make your page faster. We are going to look at page load. We're going to look at time to first, you know, we're going to look at some of these these factors. And so Core Web Vitals is a bit of a revamp of the metrics they're looking at. And what's new about them is it's not only the speed of the page, but other um, experience factors such as, you know, does the page jump around? So the sort of you know, stability of the page, as well as the interactivity of the page. So if you get to a page and it loads really fast, but if you click on something and nothing happens, that's also a bad experience. So there are three uh, metrics with the Core Web Vitals. There's LCP, largest contentful paint. That's a measure of how quickly the largest element above the fold appears when you load the web page. There's FID, first input delay. Um, that's a measure how quickly it um, Google, um, sorry, the 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 web page responds to a click or some other user action. And then finally, there's CLS cumulative layout shift. Um, this is a measure of the stability of the page. Um, so nothing's worse than you go and click a button and then the button moves and you click on the wrong button. And so that's what Google wants us to prevent happening to the users that visit our web pages. So those are the three core web vitals. Now, what's really recent is there's two beta core web vitals. One is time to first bite, which we all know about. That's the measure of how you know how long it takes the web server to respond when does it send that first byte over and then um, i think it's called 
uh, INP, um, interactive, I don't actually don't remember the exact uh, name of it, but there's a new one that's on the horizon. It's in beta, doesn't impact rankings or anything like that, but it might in the future. So, you know, definitely this is a newer um, area of Google, of SEO with Google. And so I'm not surprised to see them continuing to refine and update these metrics. And they did say in Google I.O. that they would be revisiting these metrics once a year. So mm -hmm. those are the basically the core web vitals. Um, I'm going to touch on the next question you might have, which is how important are they really? Because yeah. the industry <laughs> kind of went, well, I fixed all my core web vitals and my rankings didn't, didn't improve. And so there was a lot of stories like that. Um, so what I would tell you is they're definitely important for your bottom line metrics, such as revenue, conversion, leads. I mean, anything that improves the experience of the page for the user is going to impact your bottom line metrics better. Um, as far as rankings, what I would tell people is if you have, um, if you're like an e-commerce site, and your page is very similar to other e-commerce sites, you should probably care about Core Web Vitals than maybe a blog because, you know, co content is still king, right? If you have great content, even if your Core Web Vitals kind of suck, you're still going to rank. But if, if there's not a lot of differentiation between your page and your competitors' pages, that might be when you want to care a bit more about Core Web Vitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, can you tell for uh, someone who is not good with that, you know, because when you uh, mentioned all this uh, terminology, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I always tell my clients, uh, please create content for a human, uh, forget about uh, search engines and then optimize for search engines when you have this content, because we can't ignore SEO, but we need to think more about human. Uh, can you tell about fixing all these errors? For example, some CMS, can't, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to fix everything, you know, to uh, yes. take away all errors. Uh, Shopify, Wix, uh, even on WordPress, it doesn't matter. You, uh, when I check out with this metrics, I can see a bunch of errors. How to choose critical errors that it's uh, a must have to fix and uh, divide from others? Because, for example, let me share why I'm asking about that. Uh, I remember when one of my clients uh, fixed, uh, yeah, he spent like uh, a few weeks fixing uh, alt text on pages about us, contact page. You know, uh, we are not going to rent all these pages because uh, right. uh, these pages just help. But uh, and uh, I'm not sure that it's a good idea to fix all these errors. Yeah, we can fix it if we have no other pages to fix that we are going to rent. Can you tell more about choosing critical errors? Because when, uh, can I, when I see a bunch of errors, I don't know what to take, what to fix, and uh, what it's a must-have. Because many websites in the top 10 have these errors. So how to choose priorities? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I mean, I'll circle back a little bit to the comment I made, which is it kind of depends on the type of site you have. And if you're mostly an info site, I, you know, I think Core Web Vitals is probably not your most important thing to fix. But if you're a site that has pages that are similar to competitors, then maybe you should pay more attention. For me, you know, I want to be at parity with my competitors. So if I'm like an e-commerce site or a marketplace, like, you know, maybe I'm Yelp or one of those sites that kind of bring together two people to make a transaction. You can think of Airbnb, you know, all those types of sites. Uh, I would want to be at parity with my competitors. So if I'm more or less on the same playing field when it comes to Core Web Vitals as my competitors, then I think the a business case for doing Core Web Vitals is really more in the bottom line metrics, such as conversions, leads, um, transactions. But if your competitors are much faster than you, and yeah. you know you don't you they don't have CLS, and, you know, and you do, then I think you need to feed. So really. Um, Sometimes when people ask me that question, um, what I do is there's a uh, Google Data Studio template 
that, and you can also just do this with PageSpeed Insights. You just go put the competitors like homepage, maybe a key category page they have if you're talking e-commerce and do either PageSpeed Insights or you build like the dashboard for um, the crux data from the competitors and just see where you are in comparison with those competitors. And I think that will go a long way to answering that question for SEO. And then as I say, for conversion, if you know if you're thinking you can get you know if you know you have a lot of core web vitals and like you have a lot of cls and a lot of lcp issues um and you think you can get a better conversion rate that might be one thing you might want to look at core white vitals to help you do is to improve your conversion rate so it's a little bit of a nuanced answer but i think the bottom line is where are you in relation to your competitors yeah, yeah, got it. Valuable. Yeah, that means we need to check out our competitors as well to analyze yeah. their core web vitals and compare with us. Yeah, interesting about that. Okay, uh, you mentioned that you know, uh, even uh, you know about. Uh, uh, sorry, let me clarify this question uh, about site migration. Can you tell more about that? Because uh, I often see this issue when websites migrate uh, from uh, new domain uh, to new domain. Uh, or, for example, uh, change some pages, URLs. Can you tell how to prepare the process? Because uh, many webmasters still lose traffic in the process. Uh, even uh, they uh, provided some rebuilding campaigns and can uh, lose these backlinks. Can you tell more about preparation and how to control the process uh, during migration? Yeah, so migrations, you know, they seem really simple. It's like, oh, yeah, all you need is a bunch of, you know, you just need to make sure you have redirects for all your old URLs yeah. to make sure Google can find your new URLs. But there are so many different types of migrations. So you just mentioned one, which is we're moving from one domain to another. And then there's like, oh, our URLs are changing and we're moving to a new CMS. Or, you know, maybe our URLs are not changing, but we're redesigning. I even had a site recently that what they did is um, they had a domain where, where all they were getting all their traffic. They had two sites. One domain was getting all the traffic. The other one was the brand they wanted to migrate to. And we literally just futzed around with the DNS and pointed her her new domain to the place where the whole traffic was going. Mm -hmm. And then we set up like a bulk redirects in, in Cloudflare. And so nothing really migrated. The only thing that really changed was the DNS. So they're all kind of different. Um, in, at, to get to your question about planning, I think um, the couple things I would mention, well, it really depends on how much time you have. So sometimes people come to me, well, first of all, they come to me after the migration and you know the traffic has tanked yeah. and they want me to try to figure out what happened. <laughs> but yeah, it's ideally you want to get SEO and, and SEO involved before you actually do the migration. And I would say one number one tip I would have is just establishing a baseline. Um, so we mentioned Core Web Vitals. I would definitely just like, you know, if you're migrating to another CMS, I just want to make sure that Core Web Vitals don't get worse. You don't necessarily want to fix them. I just don't want them to get worse. But you want to um, have a set of keywords that you're tracking um, because that way you can really see if the migration tanked some of your keywords. You want to track, you, you know, you want to track your traffic, of course. And then um, the other thing I would track is indexation. Um, you know, if you had 300 pages before the migration and you weren't getting rid of a lot of pages, then I want to see 300 pages still be indexed after the migration. So I would think that establishing a baseline, but if you have a lot of time, what can be really effective is kind of reevaluating the quality of your site and figuring out like what, pay, you know, what the one thing I've noticed is people don't even look and see what are the popular pages. What are the, pay, you know, they go, oh, the homepage gets the most traffic. Well, not always. Um, they don't figure out what are their most popular pages and then they get rid of them and then they lose all their traffic. So knowing what your popular pages are and having a plan for those popular pages is really important. And if you have a lot of crap on your website, like you're one of those websites that have been adding content, adding content for like 10 years or whatever it is, it might be a good idea to just do a bit of a content audit before you do the migration. 
Um, so that would be another tip is that if you have the time, you know, maybe fixing up stuff before you actually migrate would um, might be a great benefit. And then finally, the last thing I want to just mention is if you're one of those sites with orphaned pages, which means your pages are not all linked into the, the site links graph. So in other words, I've seen pages, they're getting traffic, but if you crawl the site, you'll never find that page, right? So that's what an orphan page is. And mm -hmm. so it's not only just about crawling the site and figuring out what redirects you need for what you crawled. It's also about looking in like Google Search Console and Google Analytics and making sure you've accounted for all your popular pages because on some sites, they may not be linked into the link graph. And so you definitely need to take care of those as well. So those are just a bunch of tips I would say um, to prep for a site migration. So valuable, love it, love it. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you tell about, uh, you know, I'm interested about uh, the balance between tools and manual job. For example, if I check mm -hmm. out website, I can use Screaming Frog, Google Search Console, PageSpeed Insights, many other tools. Yeah, we have a bunch of them. Uh, but how to find the balance between uh, what we need to check out manually because tools can provide accurate data uh, or uh, using tools uh, can decide all, almost all problems. Can you tell more about that? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer kind of depends on the size of the site. So yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with a site with, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages, you're, I mean, I, and I work with sites that are that big, you really don't want to tell them, oh, you need to update your content for all these pages. Mm -hmm. um, so often we're looking for some solution with an economy of scale, like title tags is a great solution. Like uh, our example, like you really don't, people do not want to go in and update 10,000 title tags. So usually you're coming up with a template uh, where you can do variable substitution and you want to tweak that template or even test it um, for your title tags. I mean, when it comes to content, I think it's a little more challenging because, you know, we all heard, you know, you want great content, unique content, the great, you know, the skyscraper technique that Brian Dean pu pushes, pu pushes out there that your content is just so much better than anybody else's. I think that's challenging to do at scale, but, you know, there are things you can do with GP3 and some of the AI tools out there um that you know may help your content but in the end even with those tools you need a human to kind of look at the output and bless it because they're not perfect and they only can pull what's out on the internet and so you're kind of overlooking an opportunity to put unique content out there that's not there currently which often ranks the best so yeah. i yeah i think it depends on how large your site is I think on the technical side, you know, you can definitely use programmatic techniques like, you know, the title tag example I just shared. Uh, I think with content, it's a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, can you tell about how often we need to check out uh, or provide technical audit? For example, uh, uh, let me share my story. Once uh, we got uh, a broken page, we didn't know about that. Uh, and uh, some uh, blogs didn't work well on our website uh, and uh, tools didn't show about that. Uh, uh, and after a few months, uh, we lost a lot of sales. Uh, by having small website, small website, agency website, a uh, hundred pages, not more. But when uh, big clients that uh, sell a million dollars a month, uh, a lot, and uh, they can uh, get the same errors uh, time to time, we don't know why. We can fix all errors. We can provide the best audit. Everything is fine. But after some time, new errors appeal. Can you tell more about how open we need to check it out, analyze, and uh, yeah, and give new tasks for web developers? Yeah, so if I followed the question, it sounds like you have an intermittent error. Did I understand that correctly? I mean, like, how often to uh, provide technical 
optimization audit to analyze website uh, with technical errors. Uh, I mean, like one one time a month, two times a month. Uh, I don't know. Uh, from your experience. Oh, how often to fix all that stuff and what's the cadence? Yeah, yeah again, it, it does depend on the site. I mean, some sites, I, well, first of all, you gave the example of, you know, fixing alt tags on a contact us page. Yeah, that's totally not going to help. Um, I would also um, say um, if you have some 404s, I mean, John Mueller has said, you know, having 404s is not the end of the world. It's not going to kill your site. It's not a penalty if you have 404s. I mean, in that case, it's more about, you know, does this impact the user experience unnecessarily? And I mean, I think the same thing was with, with redirects. I mean, as long as you have the 301s, you know, do you, you know, one of the standard things we tell people in audits is you should always link to the target URL, whether that's a canonical or um, you don't want the URL to be canonicalized or redirect if you link to it. But in the, you know, in, in the practical reality of, you know, with today's websites, they're always changing, you know, that's not like they have like endless amount of money to devote to um, site maintenance and SEO. So often, you know, what I've done with larger sites is I just come up with a threshold. Like mm -hmm. if, you know, if there's, I mean, I'd love to see less than 1% of uh, 404s of the site, but if it's under 5%, I'm usually okay with that. I get worried when it's something like 20% of the urls or 404 ing and especially as i mentioned it is about the user and if it's a you know if it's in the nav bar you know mm -hmm. you probably need to fix that because that's a very prominent link um and i'd say thing with um i had a i had a client and they had 900 pages and they had almost 600 redirects and i was just like well this is pretty bad and one of them was going to their you know of CTA page where they were trying to convert to leads. And I'm like, you know, that's going to, the thing about redirects is, you know, we were just talking to page speed. It does slow down the experience a little bit. So if a user actually clicks on a CTA, I want to get them to that page as fast as possible so that they convert. So <laughs> that was a priority to fix, but you know, onesie, twosie links that redirect that are like in an older blog post. And, you know, because the link, you know, at the, the link, the, the URL that it links to has changed. I have less worries about that. So I kind of just come up with thresholds. And, you know, if it's like, depending on the size of the site, you know, if it's under 10% or 5%, it just depends on how many URLs they have of, you know, 404s, then it's, you know, it's, I, I don't get, I mean, especially if the site has other things that are more um, broken, um, mm -hmm. I tend not to worry. Now, you will find SEOs that they're like, you have to fix everything. <laughs> um, but I kind of take more of a middle road. It's like if it's under a certain threshold, um, I try to focus on things that are more important. And it might be for the site that, you know, they really should focus on. They should put their money towards content and not mm -hmm. pick the remaining 5% of their site that's 404s, especially if it doesn't impact the user experience unnecessarily poorly. Yeah, got it, got it, valuable. You mentioned a few times about uh, the size of websites. Can you yeah. tell more, for example, what is the main difference between analyzing a small website with 100 pages and a big website with a million pages? Uh, how, uh, what is the main difference to analyze them? Yeah, larger websites just have a, a sort of a whole other layer of classes of technical problems that smaller sites do don't. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're doing like a 300-page blog, uh, I mean, you might have a situation where you know they some of the content doesn't get traffic, and you should look at that. But with the larger site. You know, you usually have programmatically generated thin content, um, programmatically generated um, duplicate content. Yeah. Um, internal linking becomes a lot more important because with a large site like that, it's pretty easy to get to a point where you have pages that are like, you know, 
20 clicks down. And as we know, the further that you're away from the homepage in the terms of clicks, um, the less likely Google's going to think that page is important. So you have to really look at the pagination and how they implemented that. So there's just all these, this, this is the, the technical problems just get bigger and more impactful than they would for a smaller site. Mm -hmm, yeah. Can you tell about uh, tools that uh, all webmasters must to have? Uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, for technical optimization uh, and your loving list of tools. Yeah, the problem you run into with really large sites is it gets really expensive to crawl them, like a million pages. Well, first of all, I don't know about your machine, but my current machine with Screaming Frog, because Screaming Frog is a desktop mm, yeah. tool. I mean, you can get it set up in the cloud, and I, I have done that, but it's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, generally, if I'm getting to about 100 thousand pages you know it's literally you either have to have a separate machine you just leave alone and let it crawl yeah. <laughs> or you have to leave it overnight and so yeah there's there's kind of a limit when you have a desktop tool and site bulb is in that category as well i have tried setting up site bulb in uh, microsoft uh, cloud server and oh my god it was so slow and painful <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I i i you know I, I need to talk to other people who've done this more successfully so there's that problem right mm -hmm. with a large site you um you want to you probably want a cloud-based web crawler so you're looking at on crawl deep crawl there's a new one called jet octopus which i don't know a lot about but it's coming from the european side and so, and, you know, it's great if you can get all million URLs, but often what you have to do is crawl the site in sections. Like I'm going to focus on this folder um, mm -hmm. because this folder, you know, what I'll do is I'll go into, you, when I start analyzing the site that big, I try to identify the folders and the different page types. Because again, remember we were talking a little bit about at scale, it's not finding the one page with a problem, it's finding the page type, which you might have 10,000 of with that problem. Because usually if you have a problem on a page that ha is belongs to a certain page type, that problem often will exist on the other. So, you know, when you start looking at recrawling, you might be able to get, you know, your initial crawl of a million URLs. Let's just say you do that, but you're, you're going to need to recrawl and recrawl for various reasons. You might want to crawl as mobile versus desktop to see if there's parity. And so you got to get really strategic. I mean, Screamy Frog is great for okay, I just want to crawl this one folder. Okay, I want to crawl this one URL pattern. And so you just have to get a little more strategic and focused and look at the site as not a collection of individual pages, but a collection of folders and different page sites. You got, cause let's, you know, one thing we often do in an audit, audit is we go and look, okay, does it have an H1? Does it have H2s? Does the H2s have keywords in them? And you, you know, you're not gonna do that for 10,000 pages, right? So you wanna identify the page type and evaluate a representative URL of that page type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell more about crawl budget? For example, for a website that have a million pages and if we fix all these pages, uh, okay, almost uh, all these pages, can you tell how uh, to inform Google that it's better to re-index all these pages? Because on Bing we have uh, this, uh, a new tool uh, that Yandex uh, supports. But what mm. about Google? How to send all these pages that uh, we have no uh, technical errors or updated content on these pages? Yeah, crawl budget does definitely come into play with larger sites. And I think Google's out there saying, oh, well, you don't have to worry about it unless you have a million URLs. I forget the exact number. But one thing I heard on a search off the record podcast a little while ago is you know there's all these fetch when 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 google bot fetches a page just like um, a browser fetches a page it's not just that html it's like the javascript it's like the images so those are all individual fetches of those files and i'm pretty sure i heard martin split say 
you know, that counts towards that million URL threshold. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's not, you know, one URL, it's like five fetches for that one URL. And, you know, let's not even think about the fact that if you have client side rendering for your JavaScript, Google has to go through a separate process to execute that JavaScript and then recrawl that rendered page. So I, I, I tend to start worrying about um, crawl budget much lower than at the 1 million, you know, um, level. I'm, I, if you're in the five figures, I mean, I don't know, 10,000 is probably too little, but like, you know, let's say you're like 30,000, 100,000. Mm -hmm. I want to at least look at crawl budget and things mm -hmm. that it, I, I can give them one example of where I saw a positive impact for site of 30,000. Um, and what it was is that they had um, parameters and, you know, the on one set of pages, the parameters were linked to in a certain order. So this parameter one was first, parameter two was second. But on another set of pages, the parameters were reversed. Same page. It was canonicalized. So from the indexation perspective, it was fine. But from the crawl budget, it was like I looked at this and went, why are we getting Google to crawl this extra page that's just canonicalized to another page? You know, that's a waste of crawl budget. And sure enough, I re I mean, it was worse than the, the example I just gave you. And sure enough, I reduced the number of combinations from 10 to 6. And then about three weeks later, I saw a bump. Now, it could have been something else that caused that bump up in traffic, but it, mm -hmm. it felt like the right thing to to fix. I mean, especially if it's low hanging fruit like that, where you just, I mean, it was pretty easy to tell. It's pretty easy for an engineer to fix, right? Just always make sure this parameter's first. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't too hard for them to fix. So it seemed worth fixing. And, you know, I saw a positive result from it. So I think I do worry about crawl budget. I mean, I don't over assess about it because I think there's other things that might be more important, especially the smaller the site. But yeah, I mean, if let me give you an example, you know, let's just say you know index a bunch of pages on a large site. It can take months before Google sees that no index on every single page you know indexed. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to like, you know, kind of prompt Google to recrawl them by submitting a custom sitemap. So you know, when Google's not crawling a lot of those pages because you are wasting its time with various spider traps or just things like the example I just gave you, they're definitely work fixing and they seem to make an impact, especially the bigger, the, as, as you get to a bigger site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Valuable. Uh, Katia, I can't avoid one question. Sorry for that. But I can see some books on your background. Can you <laughs> tell about your loving books? Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reading is my passion and I love learning from reading. Uh, please tell our audience what books you read and how they can help you. <laughs> Uh, boy, I have all sorts of books. Um, I have science fiction books. I used mm -hmm. to be, you know, I used to read a lot of science fiction. In fact, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, I re read The Re Wheel of Time, all 14 books. <laughs> um, so, and so I'm a, I'm a big science fiction fan, but I have, um, you know, everything from financial planning to, mm -hmm. you know, I have some, I have the art of SEO book. Um, I have, uh, I have one book that I sometimes refer to. It's, it's just about building websites, but one section I really like is the color section where it kind of equates like the colors to different moods. Um, I believe I have a JavaScript book back there. Um, I think there's a Perl book, although I don't use Perl. I kind of, if I'm going to do any kind of coding, it's more on the Python side. So yeah, I just, it's a whole bunch of different books. Everything from science fiction to like, financial planning to technical books of some, I mean, I still have the original C++ book I had in my, one of my university classes. I still have that book. It's kind of falling apart, but I still have it. So there's, you know, the Carnegie Rich and Richie classic, you know, C, you know, I think it's actually C, not C++, you know, where it told you how to do pointers and things like that. So, 
yeah, I, I, I have a bunch of books. Um, I read all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't read as much as I used to, but as I said, during the pandemic, I got through the entire wheel of time from, I think the author's name is Robert Jordan. Um, I think nice. I got that name right. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, I'm interested about your experience. For example, uh, let's imagine uh, you have now uh, 12 years of experience, uh, started from scratch. What will you do to learn more about technical SEO today? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for me, the reason I, gra I mean, I'm just going to mention this even, and then I'll try to answer your question. Mm -hmm. For me, I gravitated to ex uh, technical SEO because I came out of corporate IT, um, and I used to work in um, web IT, although we called it something else. We called it web engineering in Sun Microsystems. So it was easy for me to work with developers and engineers, which in technical SEO, that's one, th especially if you get more to the enterprise layer, which is where technical SEO has more of an impact. Um, so, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, if you have a 20 page website, unless they've done something seriously wrong, which happens, mm -hmm. um, you know, technical SEO is not your needle mover, right? You know, it's more going to be more about content and aligning your content to, you know, what searchers are searching for. So, um, so I think the one thing I would just comment about technical SEO is you're going to be probably more in a team environment. You're probably going to be in a larger company. And so the ability to work it with both the marketing folks and the engineering folks is important. And being able, because you'll find that the developers, you know, they'll go, what the heck, why are you recommending this? And so you have to justify your recommendations. And, you know, you have to kind of understand more about engineering processes and I kind of have a sense, and this is why my background is helpful to me, of what's easy to fix and what's hard to fix. And you often have to learn a little bit about the system and how, um, how it works. So where to get started? with technical SEO. Um, I think the thing to realize first is technical SEO is so much more than, oh, is the title tag missing on, you know, the on-page SEO. That's just a smaller component of technical SEO. So if you mastered that part, so you got to master that part for, you got to understand what an H1 is. You need to be able to reach some HTML uh, I would say. So if you, if you don't know what a CSS file is or JavaScript, I mean, having sort of those underpinnings of web fundamentals, I mean, you don't have to know how to code, but you need to be able to like open up the source code and go, oh yeah, that's an H1 or, oh yeah, that's a title tag. I mean, so if you can't do that, I, I would say that's probably a good place to start. And yes, there's browser extensions that do all this for you. So you don't actually have to look at the source code. But then let's just say you end up on a site that has client side JavaScript rendering. Then you need to understand things like there's the raw source that the server sends over. And then there's the rendered source that happens mm -hmm. after, you know, the, the JavaScript is executed and there can be discrepancies between the two. So I would say that kind of basically being comfortable with looking source code and, under, you know, again, you don't have to know how to code, but just understanding the different components that go into a web page, I think is important. And then, as I mentioned, um, you you, you got to be solid on on-page SEO, the H1s, the title tags and all that. And then what I would say is um, just understanding challenges with indexation. Um, so if Google's, you know, if you go into Google Search Console and you see discovered but not indexed, you know, you need to kind of figure out why that might be. But I mean, I would say that the the best thing I can do to recommend to people is they start following people like Glenn Gabe, start reading Search Engine Land, and maybe look at the Moz intro to SEO with the focus on more of the technical components. I think that's that's where I would start is recommending people to follow on Twitter 
because the great thing about SEO Twitter is they're always posting articles. And I've learned a lot from other people just by following the right people. Um, so following John Mueller, for example, and yeah. Gary Ilias, who are the Google um, the Google sort of representatives that um, help us understand sort of the nuances of some of the SEO things that we look at. So I, I realized that was a bit of a ramble, but hopefully that helps. Yeah, I think guys, you need to follow Katie Ellis, you know, to learn from her because <laughs> <laughs> you can see a lot of valuable insights. By the way, tell our audience how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Yeah, so I'm Kathy Ellis Brown. If you actually search on Kathy Ellis Brown, you'll get like a bunch of stuff. Like there's my LinkedIn and there's my Twitter and then there's a blog and I will freely admit I have not been writing on my blog like I used to, but there's still posts on there that people still like that still get traffic. So um, there's still some stuff that might be useful for people. Um, I have a couple of posts on kind of DNS stuff, which comes up during migrations that have actually been kind of popular because it sort of crosses over into the web engineering world from the SEO world. Um, so yeah, I would just say if you Google on Kathy Alice Brown, um, you, you'll find no, multiple touch points of how you can get in touch with me. And yeah, I'm Kathy Alice on Twitter. Okay, guys, you can find all these links in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. You know, it's a big pleasure to learn from you. You share a lot of value. We can see, guys, you need to follow, Katie. You need to learn because you can see, yeah, so valuable. Okay, guys, love you. See you.